Hello. This is video seven. And where we are right now, we have looked at our very first example, a fairly simple example, but still uh, pretty representative of a recursive function that uh, you could almost view it as a function that's been split into two pieces. We have the public wrapper that got us inside the object so that we could actually jumpstart that recursive function going. And then the private overload, it had exactly the same name, but it was a recursive function and it called itself over and over. We could also view that, maybe it's healthier to view that as rather than calling itself over and over, it was calling a bunch of clones of itself, almost like a chain reaction. I call a print lazy debug looks just like me. That one calls another print lazy de debug looks just like it and so on down the line. Maybe that's a healthier way to think of it so that we can kind of wrap our minds around recursion. This, we are still in recursion. This video is about recursion in general. Print lazy debug was pretty simple, but still, as I said, it's also pretty representative. In practical terms, I'm gonna to try to be very wise with board space use because I'm gonna fill it up. In practical terms, What is a recursive function? Well, that was real easy, real quick to answer. In practical terms, a recursive function is a function that calls itself. Those are the rules. If you want to be recursive, you got to call yourself. There, that's all you got to do to be recursive. Now, a little more um, detail, useful detail, practical detail abstract terms what do these recursive functions have in common can i spell abstract a b s t r a c t abstract terms the big pieces the general pieces two pieces two pieces now this is not the public wrapper in the private overload no 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 this is the two pieces inside the recursive function itself we're focusing just on that Piece number one, uh, I'm going to put in parentheses up front, at least one, at least one base case. Base case, I'm going to call, uh, describe it as where recursion bottoms out. I, bet, I guess I should put that in quotes. That's not a technical term. Where recursion bottoms out, where we hit the bottom and it's time to back out. Uh, I'm still using expressions. It's how the function knows to stop calling itself. Stop calling yourself. Stop calling yourself. How did that work in print lazy debug? Let's see. Well, it hit the end of the list. When it got to a zero pointer, it was looking for that. And when it got to a zero pointer, it realized it had reached the complete end of the complete list. No more recursive calls. Otherwise, we fall off the end and crash and burn. Oh, all sorts of horrible things happen. That's big piece number one of the abstract terms. Big piece number two. Possibly several. Bli several recursive cases. Now, really, we could think of it as, and some of these, just one recursive case. So I'll put parentheses s out here. Maybe there are several recursive cases. Uh, when are we going to look at an example of that? Oh yeah, lab one, the lab one dot cpp program. That recursive function calls itself from more than one place. And each one of those would be considered a recursive case where it keeps calling itself, keeps calling itself. And that's a possibility. We could also have multiple base cases, but I'm going to group all those together and say we're just testing for all of these different things that could stop us from calling ourselves. I don't know if that distinction is clear at all. Clear as mud. In the recursive case, a problem, here's the strange thing, a problem or algorithm, I'll call it a problem. A problem is expressed 
in terms of subproblems. And here's the kicker. In terms of subproblems that are identical to itself. And if you recall that weird around the block way I kind of snuck up on the print lazy debug was to write the function, write another function, write another function, and then we pause and reflect on that for just a second. Well, wait a second. We don't have to keep writing new functions all the time. These are all exactly alike, except for the function name. That was our clue to, you know what? We only need one of these, just have it call itself. And we view that as if it's calling clones of itself repeatedly over and over to get out to the end of the list. We could view each of those as separate functions until we get out to the end of the list. That's what this is really talking about. A problem is expressed in terms of subproblems that are identical to itself, which is what keeps us from having to write the same function over and over again, for crying out loud. If it's going to do exactly the same thing when it gets to the next step, then just call the same function over again. Now, if I, I make this sound as if, well, of course, well, of course, it's easy. Recursion, I will grant you, recursion is really a wild and crazy difficult concept to get used to when it's first thrust upon you, which is what I'm doing now. Um, also, I did not leave enough board space, so all of this is going to have to go away. One moment, please. Still talking about recursion in general. But I'm a picture drawer, and it's time for a picture, I think. Let's say... Now, we're, we're doing object-oriented programming, so I'm, I'm going to make it look as if um, this only makes sense in the context of a class, where we got functions of a class, and that's not true, but for our purposes, for now at least, we can, we can assume that they're all going to follow this pattern, and I hope that pink box is big enough. This is an object, whatever it is. Maybe it's a linked list object. Maybe it's an ordered list object. Maybe it's some other object that we haven't dreamed up yet. But how do we get going here? Well, somebody has got to sort of kickstart or jumpstart this whole process from the outside. So whatever our application is up here, I'll just put a tiny little main in the sky. This is a fig, by the way. This is not a description, this is a picture. The main program up here does, does whatever it does, and then it decides, you know what, I need the service of that recursive algorithm that's been implemented in that object. So I'm gonna call a function. What function does it call? You know which function it calls. This is the initial call from outside the object. Just to get inside the object. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We have seen that before. Switch color. This is our, uh, 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 open up, this is our public wrapper. Our public wrapper function, I might as well leave that one open. This is our get my foot in the door so I can see all those private variables function. So the main program has no choice but to go through the public interface of the public functions, calls the public wrapper. This is, I, I can't even read that myself, I-N-I-T-I-A-L. Initial call from outside the object. All it does is get us in here. We are not recursive yet. Here comes a recursion. I hope I leave space for that. We've got our base case over here. Of course we do. You know, I might have to redraw this picture. You might want to just watch the video and then go back and draw the picture later. Uh, the base is test for base case. Now, that's not a separate function. I'm putting that in a box. I'm telling you, this picture is going to grow somewhat organically. But this is the public wrapper, and what I've done is now done the first piece of the private overload. And we're inside the object now, so we can see all the private variables that we may need to see. And then we've got the recursive case, or cases. This is where we break down 
the algorithm, ALG. That algorithm, don't look, I mean, if you're not familiar with algorithms, that just means the logic design of the program that you're implementing. You are making an algorithm real. Technically, the algorithm is abstract. When you turn that into code, it becomes an application, yada, yada, yada. Break down the algorithm into recursive function calls. And you know what? I think I had plenty of room for my picture. That's another piece in another box, but those two pieces together. Uh, I think I numbered those one and two, didn't I? That's part number one, that's part number two. And this, whoops, after all that trouble, try to save room, I told you. This, all of these, these are the private overload. They're private because this is only prototyped inside the private section of your object, of your class. The main program can't call it even if it wants to. Private overload. There. <laughs> Why does it need to be private? Well, very typically, it needs to be able to access the private variables of the object. In our linked list example, it had to be able to see head or cursor or tail or at least some of those, or it wasn't going to be able to do what it needed to do. Now, these two pieces together from the external view, from outside the big pink box, outside the object, the main program, all it knows is it's calling that one function. It calls print lazy debug, and then print lazy debug itself calls the private overload. That's why this is called a wrapper. It's, it's like wrapper in the Christmas wrapping paper sense. It wraps around this and presents an external view that uh, is, is almost overly simplified. We call print lazy debug with no parameters, then it turns around and calls the workhorse behind the scenes that does all the real work. Okay? Th today uh, is uh, apparently erase the board day because I've used up so much space, I'm going to have to erase the board again. I hope you could read all that before I have to erase it, which would be about now. So I can keep talking about these are all things, uh, helpful household hints of designing recursive algorithms in general before we get serious about it and quit messing around with lazy debug functions. So, uh, you know what, I'll call them that. These are, well, not helpful household. These are tips and tricks, bag of tricks. Ticks, tips and tricks, can't say it for designing recursive functions. Are these hard or fast rules? Well, just barely not. These are almost hard and fast rules. And if you violate these or you don't do these, then you're setting yourself up for trouble. One, especially one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to do this one. This is a rule. Make sure it's possible to reach a base case through the chain of recursive case calls through a chain of recursive, R-E-C-U-R-S-I-V-E, -E, recursive case, well, cases. Uh, calls is redundant in a way. The recursive cases, of course, they call it themselves. Make sure it's possible to reach a base case through a chain of recursive cases. I, I am so happy that I have an example that I can refer back to, print lazy debug. Make sure it's possible to eventually get to the end of the list. Why? Why? Well, if you don't, you have infinite recursion. Every time the function calls itself, it makes a brand new stack frame that at least has a return address, whether it has any parameters or not. Even for a void function with no parameters, a new stack frame still has to be allocated for a function call. So if you call yourself in an infinite loop, generating infinite recursion, it will eventually eat up all space available in the stack, bump into the heap, 
segmentation fault, on old systems, core dump. It would show you all this hex, uh, hex translation of the machine language. Oh, it was a nightmare. Don't go there. This is, this is the um, recursive equivalent of an infinite loop uh, using a while. If you've got a while condition that can never become false by executing the body of the while loop, you've got an infinite while loop. And that one just makes it look like the screen freezes. This will crash the program. This will crash the program. So in our uh, print lazy debug example, there had to be a way to eventually get to the end of the list. If instead of passing it, all I had to do, if you want to experiment with this and actually generate a controlled segmentation fault, go into print lazy debug, and when it calls itself recursively, instead of passing in p arrow next, that takes it to the next notch down the line each time, just pass in p. Pass in that same pointer over and over again. Crash! It's never going to leave the first node, yet it will still keep calling itself recursively, and eventually it will use up all the storage available for the stack. Okay, enough on that. Now then, these. These are the ones that are extremely strong recommendations that are not necessarily going to crash your program. To use only local variables whenever possible. Set up temporary variables inside your recursive function. Use the parameter values. And a subtle thing, a subtle thing, it's typically better not to pass your variables in by reference. Why? Well, if you pass variables in by reference to a recursive function, what you're doing, now sometimes you have to do this, it's intentional, but what you're doing is actually passing exactly the same variable all the way through your chain of recursive calls. Lab one is a good example of this. Lab one, I think it had a variable called depth. What happens is, if you only use local variables and you don't use reference parameters, then when a function finishes and returns and its stack frame has popped off, then all of a sudden the previous version of that variable surfaces in the stack and now depth, without you doing anything, there was no minus one or anything, when we came back from a function call in lab one, when it came back, the depth automatically went back to its previous value. It went from three to two. Then when we returned from that, it went from two to one. How could it do such a thing? Well, the secret is, it was only using the local parameter depth variable. And there was a separate depth variable for every single recursive call with a different value. All these different variables with the same name but they are completely different variables. They live in completely different memory locations in the stack. So each one could have a different value that we could pop back to. It's like when you pop the stack, then you can see what's underneath it. The next one underneath, and the old value came back to life, and when it popped, now I'm repeating myself. I'm in an infinite loop, so I'll move on. Uh, what else? Uh, this one is really abstract and weird. I don't really know uh, a nice, easy, understandable way to say it. It's related to number two. Take a local view. Rather than a global view. And I'll even put in parentheses out here. That's tricky. That you, you develop a knack for that. You'll have to develop a a spidey sense that tells you, oh, be careful here. I'm drifting toward a global view rather than a local view. Here's, here's kind of a, a feeble, mild example, but still it might give you the general idea. The all version, the original version of um, print debug, it had a global view. It knew about the entire linked list. In fact, it looped through the whole thing with a for loop. It knew that all those nodes were in there and it was printing out all of them itself, that one function call. Contrast, compare that to the new, well, a new, new version, I don't know if it's new and improved, but the print lazy debug, it was focused on one node. It got a pointer value in variable P, I believe it was, that pointed at one node. That's the only node it cared anything about at all. It printed out the value in that one node. Print out, C out, P, arrow, data. That's all I care about. The rest of it is not my job. Somebody else's business, I'm going to pass the buck. It called another function. Here, you go off and you print the rest of the list 
I can't even see that. I don't care about that. I'm going to stay here and focus on my one node that has Darby in it. That's the only one I care about. So the recursive calls, each one of the recursive calls was taking a very local view of that linked list, focused on one particular node, and it didn't, it, it didn't even care what was going on elsewhere in the list. That's, that's what you have to do. And, and the reason that's so tricky, the reason that's so hard, is because when we are designing this, and we are looking at arrays or lists or two-dimensional arrays or something even worse for crying out loud, uh, when we're looking at that, we can see the whole thing. Of course, we've drawn out a picture before we started trying to design our code, but we can see the whole thing. The hard part is you draw out this whole linked list with head cursor, tail, and everything. If you've got a successful, well-designed recursive function that operates on that list, it's only going to be able to see one node. And that's it. It doesn't care whether it's the head or the tail of the cursor or anything. It doesn't even know where it is. All it knows is somebody told me about one node, and that's all I care about. So just kind of hold that thought until we really have to, super have to do that. Four, I've already hinted at this. Uh, actually, I'll call it a hint. Think like the system does when it's running recursion. How does the system think? Pretend that recursion doesn't exist. That sounds like, that, that sounds very tempting, doesn't it, at this point? Pretend that recursion doesn't exist. Now, what do I mean the system doesn't know? That was that hand-waving example I gave uh, earlier when print lazy debug calls print lazy debug calls print lazy debug, the system doesn't care. All it knows is a function called some other function. I've got to make a brand new stack frame for this fresh function call. It's from the point of view of the system, it's exactly the same as if the main program called function A, function A called function B, function B called function C, they're all separate from each other. The system doesn't know, doesn't care. In a way, it's taking its own local view. All it knows is this function called that function, and I need a new stack frame for it. This, this is almost ridiculously hard to do until we actually have some more experience, see some more examples. Pretend that recursion exists just means don't worry about things that are not your problem. The, the, the successful recursive function algorithm designer is going to take such a narrow, blinder local view that all it pays attention to is the one thing right in front of it right now. I, I'm, I'm wearing out the linked list example, but that's all we have to refer back to. A recursive function that's successful on a linked list only thinks about that one node and pretends like, you know what, I, I, I don't know anything about recursion, uh, but I know I can write a function that will print all the rest of the list after me. I'll just call that. Here, print the rest of the list and call that function name print the rest of the list. That was the original version of print lazy debug, if you recall. One more, and this is another one. You know what? This list is going to be a lot more useful after we've seen some more examples. But this way, you have something to sort of refer back to. Uh, five is be careful to distinguish be careful to spell distinguish correctly be careful to distinguish between I'll put this in quotes on the way in to recursion and on the way back out. Now believe it or not, almost as an afterthought, almost so casually you might have completely missed it. But when I first introduced the print lazy debug at the very end of that video, like in the first, no, no, not the first, the last 10 or 12 seconds, maybe even, I said, well, you know what, just a thought experiment, uh, switch around so that the see out statement and the recursive call, just flip those two lines and see what happens. What happens? Well, the way the originally, uh, the way it was originally written, the see out statement was on the way into recursion. In other words, it was something we did before we made the recursive call. That's referred to as something that we're doing on the way into recursion. I print it and I go to the next one. I print it, I go to the next one. So I'm printing it on the way into recursion as things are getting deeper and deeper.
That afterthought, that last 15 second afterthought at the end of that video was if you switch those around, you make the recursive call first, then make another recursive call when it gets there. Recursion again, recursion again. On the way out of recursion is when it starts returning from those recursive calls. And if I've swapped the see out statement and the recursive call, then on the way out of recursion is when it's gonna print out the no data value and it's gonna print out the list backwards. Swapping two lines makes a difference between printing out the entire linked list forward, front to back, and printing out the entire linked list backwards, back to front. On the way out of recursion is stuff you do after you get back from a recursive function call. And that's what this is talking about here. Now, it was, it was fun and games, um, easy example for print lazy debug. There are algorithms where you really have to focus to distinguish between things you want to do on the way in and things you want to do on the way back out. In fact, we are going to look at some of those algorithms. And if we get these mixed up, there's no way. There's no way the code's going to work, the function won't work, no nothing. Sometimes you got to do stuff right before you make the recursive call. Sometimes you need to do something right after you get back from the recursive call. That's this, on the way in, on the way back out. Okay, all these help, this, this is actually, for all the abstraction and all the appeals to common sense and examples and everything, this video is actually pretty packed. This is one that you might put a gold star next to that you want to come back and watch again later after we've looked at some more examples. Because none of this stuff is fluff. This is all real. It's real stuff. I'll see you online.